Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, wherever you may be in the world. My name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Center here at the University of Sydney. And we host these international research webinars every month. Before we start, can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the university is based, the traditions and elders of the peoples of this land who are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in the case of the University of Sydney. I recognize their traditions and elders past, present and emerging on land which has never been ceded. Today, we are very privileged to have two wonderful speakers. The main speaker, Anna Alas from uh, Max Planck in Berlin, who's going to talk about Chinese management of science right now. And then from UTS, uh, Marina Jang, who is, again is another expert in this area on the management of technology in China. So I'm going to hand over to them. But before I do, can I remind you that in the question and answer session at the end, please put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And Marina will read out the questions and put them to Anna when the time is right. So now over to Marina and uh, let's hear what's going on. Thank you, David. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me just introduce uh, uh, Dr. Anna Lisa um, Eilis first. Um, Anna is the head of the Lis uh, Magna Research Group, China in the Global System of Science at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. This is a highly interesting um, research area uh, Anna and her team um, are doing. So without further ado, let me just uh, uh, pass on to Anna for her presentation. She will give a presentation for about um, 35 minutes. And um, uh, if you have any questions, please, as David suggested, write your, your, your questions in the chat box and we will address your questions after the presentation. And I uh, will join you actually to ask questions myself uh, after Anna's presentation. Um, let's welcome Anna. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, David, for inviting me and for hosting the seminar and for Marina for introducing me. Um, it's all very generous. I'm happy to be with you today, if only virtual, and to discuss um, a new research field that I um, yeah, recently um, entered. I'm going to share my PowerPoint with you now. I hope you can see it. If not, you just have to shout and let me know. Um, so Maria has already mentioned that I'm the head of a new research group at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, the name is China and the Global System of Science. We have gathered um, a group of, I would call them mainly social scientists who are interested in the topic, the development of the Chinese science system over the past few decades and its global integration. We have four main research areas that you can see listed on the left side in the green box. So today's topic is more or less uh, aligned with the second and the third one. So um, structures, and norms of China science policy and the agency left for scientists and scholars in, in China to move in these, um, in these structures. Um, we have existed from the very beginning together with the pandemic, so our research designs were heavily influenced by that. Um, most of us have not done empirical field work for the last three years, which is really um, sad, but we hope to be picking it up again um, this year. So, in what I want to share with you today, ideas and um, structures of governing science in the PRC today, I have three main points or areas that I want to touch upon. First, of course, I want to outline to you why I think this is an interesting field, also for policy analysis. Um, most of you will, I think, immediately grasp it and maybe are already working in this field, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on that, but I started off with that. Um, my main part, or the main part of my talk, um, is about my observation of a certain divergence or even paradox of the parallel existence of a very strong science bureaucracy and technocracy in China, and an again increasing ambition by the party, the CCP, to control what is going on in science and technology. 
Um, and I'll do that on the basis of these three areas that I've listed here, goals of science policy, the main steering and incentive structures, um, and also a global outlook. And I close by asking critically um, myself, but also all of you, whether this policy field is really worth studying. And is it a policy field? And is it different from other policy fields? If we research contemporary China, you could say, well, it looks exactly like the things we observe in, I don't know, economics or other areas. So why bother um, to look at it here? Um, and also some questions about good research designs uh, for future um, exploration of this topic. So I could bring you loads and loads and loads of data and illustrations of the so-called rise of Chinese science over the past um, decades, the rise of or the increase of Chinese contributions to the global system of science. You have probably read that China is now the biggest producer of scientific articles, especially in the natural sciences and engineering. Um, so this is all already in the world. Um, I think an interesting development recently is that uh, think tanks, other research organizations and the media are uh, dissecting these big numbers and looking into different fields of science and technology to find out um, how big the influence of science and technology coming from China is globally. Um, an Australian think tank, ASPE, has a few weeks ago produced this report um, which showed that China is already leading in, in many of the uh, research areas they have um, studied. I brought you this one quote from a Reuters report on this study. You've probably read it. And the main gist here was uh, additionally that it's now become a real system um, competition or rivalry. So it's science produced in democratic contexts ver versus science in non-democratic contexts. And of course, China is the biggest player um, in the latter group. Um, so this has become yeah, one of the stories being told. You can take these indexes with a grain of salt, I think. But there are more and more studies which can show indexes by nature or other science organizations and, and uh, publishers that can show that there are outputs in many fields where you could already say that Chinese contributions are leading, for example, zero uh, net zero um, emission technologies and things that are also very important for solving global uh, grand challenges uh, today. So this is one of the main stories. I think what is often, and that's why I brought this second um, graphic, what is often sidelined is the fact that when you look at the so-called rise of Chinese contributions, the main um, focus is on natural sciences and technology. And that is maybe a natural assumption because we would um, think that under non-free or non-democratic conditions, of course, social sciences and humanities are the first victims or the main victims, and they cannot really thrive. But it's interesting to see that if you look at data, there's also indication that contributions to social science and humanities coming from China is also really on the rise quantitatively and qualitatively. Again, you could look at different uh, ways that that is counted. Social science citation index is one. So not only the numerical output in total, but also the quality, if you want, of output is measured there and China's contributions are also on the rise in that regard. Last big macro um, illustrations be before I move on. I think it is an odd thing to say Chinese science. I mean, it is also a, a, a difficult term, I think, uh, but given the highly global nature of science as it's done um, in our times now, um, that is also very visible if you look at China's or the position of Chinese output, China, Chinese or science made in China uh, compared globally. Uh, you can see that among the five big science nations that nature has outlined, China is one, it's only second to the United States. But what is more important is the intensity of collaboration that is measured in publications, mostly in projects and patents. And you can see that in the thickness of the lines here on the left side, and you can see that many of the lines going to or from China are already very thick. So China is, or Chinese contributions are a very important part of world science. And only my own institution, the Max Planck Society, 
they do list uh, their main international partners, I think annually. So these numbers are from 2021. And the Chinese Academy of Science is number six, and it is the second uh, largest international partner in co-publications. So again, also regarding what we discuss in Europe, for instance, at the moment, should we um, decouple or restrict scientific collaboration that will have very, very significant effects on how science is done um, also in Europe, just to highlight that again. So if we see these impressive numbers and if we for a moment assume that contributions from China are on the rise in the global system of science, then of course the immediate question is how do they come about? Uh, what is their origin? What is the foundation? And there are these rather simple narratives, I think, around which say that, um, first of all, of course, in, a, in an autocracy like China, it's very easy to steer things from the top. So once uh, the party leadership, the government has a vision, a strategy for science and technology, just put it in place and then make everything um, and everyone fall in line. I think we know from uh, studying Chinese politics that that is usually not how it uh, works and how it looks like on the ground. And I think that is true for science policy as well. Uh, then the argument is that, well, over the past 20 years, one example is university rankings. Chinese um, actors were just picking low-hanging fruits because they just put a mass of resources and human resources and financial resources in certain fields and then just reap the benefits of it. And it's actually not so much about quality, it's, it's mainly quantity. Also that, I think, by just looking at citation numbers can easily be discarded. Um, and then uh, there is this overarching narrative also when we talk about what kind of global effect do these developments have, that there is this grand master plan that's a bit similar to the first point of, okay, this is the science system we want to build and this is the influence we want to have globally, and that's how we do it at the leadership level. And again, I think in what I will say, um, you will hopefully be convinced by me that this is not so, so easy or so simple. Um, so if, if you want to understand clearer where I'm coming from or what my approach is, you've probably already heard when I say science, I am actually meaning I'm not an English native speaker, so we have to apologize, um, or I have to apologize for maybe not uh, picking the best terms. In German, we can say Wissenschaft, and then you would immediately cover any discipline in uh, science and scholarship, including the social sciences and humanities that you can imagine. So that's actually what I would, uh, or what I'm interested in if I look at the developments in China. So the broadness, the whole spectrum, the comprehensiveness of of science and scholarship, the academia um, in this context, um, not confined to natural sciences and, and engineering. Also, I think we have brilliant studies um, on what is called the Chinese innovation system or um, the commercialization of science, where that is the main interest. It's often economic studies um, where uh, it is explained and explored how innovations come about and how they are put into practice and then so commercialized and, and uh, becoming technology that can be sold and bought and everything. I think I am also at, at, as much interested in the basic research side of things. So, so the you could call it the input side um, of the science system, uh, which is, I would say, not as much covered in research. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's worth doing that. So that's also what we try in the group. And then it is also coming from my own background as a political scientist or political sociologist. And um, I think it is worth doing policy analyses in this field. Uh, when I say governing or steering here today, I of course mainly take the state's perspective on um, on how science is imagined and scientific uh, governing is imagined. And just, just very, very briefly, an outlook on what we have um, in, the, uh, yeah, in the existing research literature, uh, where I think these aspects that I've just highlighted are not very well covered in current literature. Uh, so the one, the, uh, this orange uh, background is supposed to outline this book by Tony Seitz, for instance where you have a more structured systematic overview of the 
the policy system behind science and technology or STI in China. That was done for the reform era. I haven't seen, and maybe you can uh, correct me, something similar for the very current stage we are in. So like a systematic overview of the main actors and institutions and mechanisms covering these aspects that I've just um, outlined. There is a lot on the Mao era, there's a lot on the, reform, the early reform and opening era, there's anthropological studies, there's innovation studies, but these things that in Chinese language you would find very easily, the country overviews um, are not that present. And then again, so there is a richness of Chinese studies. Sometimes they don't really uh, cover exactly the kind of sociology of science aspects that I would be interested in. So th these two bodies of literature don't usually match. Um, and I think, yeah, there's room for um, some structured overview of, of, um, of science and or academic policies in China currently. I have for a different uh, talk and a different project once outlined how I see um, the political leadership's grasp on science ever since the founding of the People's Republic of China and the interactions between science and politics. I will not go through this. I mean, you see this long list uh, for the two eras, the early PRC decades and the reform and opening era here. I don't have time to do this very historical overview, but I've highlighted a few points, I think, which I can quickly name because they are related to how I see changes under the current um, leadership or say within the last two decades. Um, I'm planning to prepare a book manuscript about it, so I'll put all of these details in there, but here for today, I think it should suffice to highlight a few aspects. Um, in this overall approach of the CCP or the political leadership to science and scholarship in China, um, you, I think, can easily um, depict how uh, the change looks like when we move from the Mao era to the reform and opening era. So in the Mao era, science technology, when it happened, was highly politicized. It followed this political course. Um, it followed a Soviet model of of universities and reform, and uh, sorry, and research organizations. Um, there was no real uh, influence of global standards of scientific evaluation that will become an important aspect later. Um, it was a very, um, say, practice oriented system with naturally a focus on engineering, which was close to the Soviet model. Um, and overall, it was a party, the CCP, that designed how academic activities, how research, if at all, was going to happen in Mao China. That all changed, I think, tremendously in the reform and opening era when science was considered one of the pillars of modernization. It was important for economic development. You needed a highly skilled um, and educated workforce. And so the ministries that were responsible for science policy also began to import um, so-called Western or like international standards of, of uh, performance evaluation. So from uh, science indicators to university rankings, for instance, to measure, to first of all, push the development of Chinese institutions, but also to gradually measure its standing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other global institutions. There was also the, the reintroduction, I could say, of um, other models of doing research and university education, more an American style model, some references to European university models, again, that had existed in the pre-Mao era. Um, and overall, the steering of all of this was in the hands of what I called also in the beginning, the bureaucracy or like ministries. They were working very technocratically, importing all these, as I said, all these evaluation criteria and indexes and rankings and slowly integrating Chinese universities and research organizations into these, into these structures. And what we see today, I think, is a mixture of both of that. Um, again, I would have to talk for a long time to go through all these details, um, but I think that uh, what I've just said, for instance, the import of um, other successful global models of universities, uh, following or aligning with a um, more or less American standard that is matched now with more calls for 
um, forging institutions that have Chinese characteristics and to also bring that to the global stage to have something to offer a Chinese model or something. I'm more skeptical. I don't see a real Chinese model of the university evolving as of yet, but maybe that is something we can discuss. But it's clear that there is a more uh, emphasis, more calls for these indigenous and local and global Chinese um, characteristics and all of that. Also from this very pragmatic focus of the research and uh, the reform and opening era, where um, a lot of emphasis was on forming national talent, this whole idea of science, technology, innovation has now become a global one, putting China in global competition. So the search for talent is also global and uh, the Chinese political leadership is envisioning China's rise to a global leader in all of that. I don't see that so present in the reform and opening era. Um, and finally, that also means that we now have the combination of um, yeah, the technocracy and the party in controlling all of these developments. So just uh, because we're talking or I'm talking about 21st century, um, some emphasis again, uh, also in party messaging, there is a mixture of, I would say, this global focus on now making China globally competitive and coupling that with calls for um, indigenous science and innovation and Chinese characteristics. So in the social science dimension, for instance, you want, or there is calls for theories with Chinese characteristics. I have some ideas about what that is, but you can see that there is this combination now again, moving away from the more matter of fact technocracy of reform and opening era to something um, that is uh, yeah, characterizing current science policy. It's hard to say, and that's maybe one of the main messages also for all the rest of what I'm going to say, where this is going. I think also in Western media, whenever Xi Jinping says something very harshly about, you know, scientists have their motherland and they have to defend Chinese characteristics, this is picked up. But the fact that these other things, global orientations, evaluation criteria coexist, um, is not that much covered, but I think it's there and it's important to, to take that into account. I won't go through it all. It is reflected in Xi Jinping's speeches. If you go through them, there's all these factors mixed together. So you have, science has to be steered by the party in China. It has, however, to, uh, to be aligned with uh, global um, science governance. Uh, China has to work with other nations, be, uh, yeah, in, in the global ambitions to solve global problems. But then again, you want Chinese characteristics in the very Chinese style STI system um, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's diffuse mes messaging, I would say. Uh, next to it, um, again, as I said, this very bureaucratic steering approach uh, coexists. Um, you know that from the tradition of making big plans, for example, there is a science and technology plan that is due to be renewed anytime soon, maybe now, um, which highlights specific fields in science and technology that have to be pushed and where most of the resources are going. Um, it all seems to be very yeah, technocratically planned, uh, how China is going to be, and that is one of the visions, uh, the leading global science power by 2050. Um, and again, the, the way to measure this is China standing in international rankings and indexes. So focus on global leadership, same time Xi Jinping visits Chinese universities and outlines that there have to be universities with Chinese characteristics, um, that the party of course gets this renewed uh, strong role in universities and research organizations. And there's even, even references to these historical slogans of uh, both red and expert um, in his speeches to mostly university managers and administrators, but I think it's a message that is, of course, also going to the scientists and students um, altogether. The technical steering, I, I, I think, so I first prepared an overview of all the institutions and the funding schemes, but I think that's very technical, so I'll just um, focus on a few mechanisms or new developments that I think highlight a few of the dynamics that I'm most, mostly interested in. Um, again, if we talk about the steering of plans and funding schemes for STI, there is a bureaucratic or ministerial side of things. 
uh, for instance, the renewed effort to bolster basic research, because also Chinese leadership understands that if you want to become a global leading nation, you cannot only do that in the applied field, you also have to come up you know, with innovative theories and innovative findings and groundbreaking uh, frontier research in the basic area. And that's where a lot of funding is going now through the ministries. But then there's also this idea that you can foster basic science, applied science, or basic research, applied research, and then commercialization in what is called state key laboratories and some other uh, models you bring all these things together plus education to yeah top down steer how innovation is coming about i think uh, marina jang knows much more about that um but that i to to my understanding is still more, mainly driven by the ministries ministry of science and technology mainly uh while the party has its own ideas of how science should um, function so there's also um, emphasis on basic research, but as Xi Jinping says himself, basic research always have, has to have this application in mind. And these are party slogans. I mean, if that ever comes about, it would be a new model of doing science. I don't see that materializing at the very moment, but who knows. And then, of course, there were recent changes introduced uh, at the two sessions meetings this March, where the Ministry of Science and Technology's responsibilities are restructured. Again, it's too early to say, I think, what that means. Uh, what is important, I think, is that the party has said that it will take a stronger role again in steering science and technology uh, yeah, governance, and that is happening under this new Central Commission of, for Science and Technology. Again, we'll have to see. I think there is this clear signals in the also while China is facing the, the uh, technology struggles uh, with the United States, especially, and also with recent restrictions in Europe, uh, most observers say that these structural changes are uh, related to that. But yeah, it's, I think we can discuss that. I think it's, it's too early to say where this is leading. A few aspects regarding the incentives that those structures create for the personnel, the scientists and scholars. Again, we have a bureaucratic approach to this. There is a lot of reform regarding um, the uh, evaluation system in China. So while uh, international publications were pushed so much over the past decades and even got bony payments for that, uh, that's an account on the left side, how much you could earn for papers in certain journals. The ministries have moved to change that because there were also unintended consequences of that, a little fraud and corruption and, and all of that, and came up with new guidelines for um, evaluations and for luring talent back to China and things like that. Again, very much a bureaucratic approach in my view. At the same time, again, uh, the party has, of course, influence on how science and scholarship is produced and where it sets incentives. Not very surprisingly, um, the main incentives that are pushed by the party are for the STEM fields. Social sciences and humanities are more or less discriminated against because you can easily define taboo topics or sensor things more easily than in science and, tech, uh, in, yeah, science and um, technology and engineering. I think it's not that black and white, but still uh, there's no question about the fact that social sciences and humanities are in a much weaker position in China. It's not a unity of science idea uh, that we have there. Also, there's guidelines for not vilifying the country, uh, for getting academic credits if you write policy reports instead of only academic papers and things like that. So the political party steering of incentives is also there. And I think, I mean, those of you who work in institutions in China at the moment can, can tell much more about that. I think the effects can vary a lot. So from anecdotal evidence, when I talk to Chinese colleagues, um, yeah, my, my impressions are quite diverse, I have to say. Um, then finally, what are the ideas when it comes to situating um, science made in China in the global domain? Uh, recently, there have been a lot of signals uh, saying that the Chinese political leadership is actually 
uh, trying to withdraw China, Chinese science, Chinese scientists from a lot of the global structures. Um, very significantly, of course, there is restrictions on data exchange. There are new agencies for screening data that is used then in international collaboration and in publications. That's not something that is so particular to China. I think other countries do it too, but we know that in China it also has a political, a very, very political side to it. Uh, anything could be called state secret or, or something that goes uh, against national security and can be then withdrawn. And also, as you've maybe seen in recent days, there's announcement that's actually steps to remove foreign access to Chinese databases, including CNKI and others which is quite significant for uh, global exchanges. And there was this big story um, last year, end of last year, that Chinese universities are withdrawing from university rankings. So after they have been so successful the last 15 years and risen constantly, suddenly uh, they might withdraw. It only were three of them. And there's, I think, very compelling explanation I especially these three, because they haven't been really successful in these international rankings anyway, but it was seen as a, as a signal to say that, okay, we can also just, you know, leave again after we've played along uh, for so long and we were quite successful. Um, it comes with calls to be more independent of so-called Western standards of evaluation. And I think it's, in a way, it's true that you can see that these were often imported categories for science evaluation. And now there should be more emphasis on, as I said, indigenous innovation, but also universities with Chinese characteristics and values that are more important to China maybe than to other countries. And they should be reflected in the evaluation of um, scientific and scholarly performance as well. So that tendency is there. Again, I don't think it is, the, the, there is a dramatic shift already. I think it's, it's, a, it's a formulated, um, ambition and it will be important to follow how that will develop and over the next few years. I don't see a complete turn away from, for instance, uh, international rankings yet, which I think is still important to uh, underline. And the other side of the story again, and now with more focus on, um, on scientists and scholars based in China, uh, who are affected by all these dynamics. I think what we can see, however, is still that there is a certain, say, autonomy. I mean, in Europe, we very much like to talk about academic freedom. I think this term is much too big um, to capture um, realities also in, in science systems over here. So if we talk about um, autonomous structures, maybe, um, then there is some of that left also when it comes to um, Chinese STI and some rooms for agency of the ones working in these structures. Um, I think a very important part, and that's what I try to highlight by showing the embedded, the global embeddedness of, of um, science produced in China is the individual integration into the global science system. So um, scientists and scholars with in a global educational background, international background, maybe returning to China, but still very much engaged in these, uh, with these ties and relations that doesn't easily go away. And it also often has to do with how people work and what they see as their audience and their, yeah, also evaluation criteria. I think there is so much scientific intrinsic um, motivation present and that is very hard to be removed. And I think when I talk to colleagues, I'm always pretty impressed by how, because people are used to restrictions, how you find ways to, to still function um, under them and to even produce excellent um, outcomes. And I think that should not be forgotten um, while we hear about all these uh, shrinking spaces, which is of course the main story, but um, there is patient at excellence um, and at yeah, a global or a cosmopolitan nature of science and, um, and scholarship, and that should also be highlighted. And on the right side, you just see two examples of how that plays out. I think, I mean, those were the days in uh, early 2020, there was all these stories that Chinese laboratories were sharing the 
genomic sequences of the new virus that is found in, in China. And so they were doing what they were always doing, sharing data until then there came the political gag orders and things. So in, in the first instance, um, global science uh, still worked until it was controlled from the top. And an example for agency, maybe you followed what is now happening around these infamous um, CRISPR babies in China. He Jianghui, the main uh, scientist behind it, he's very much an out, uh, outsider in China now. And there's a lot of push by the Chinese scientific community to change um, ethical rules. And actually the new rules that were launched uh, very recently, they are a product of heavily or heavy lobbying by scientists in China themselves. So I think you can see there is even you know ways to to do some uh, to have political influence among Chinese scientists. So coming to an end, um, as I said, to maybe open up our discussion. So the main observation that I hope I was able to share with you today is that there are very paradox signals <laughs> regarding the orientation of um, Chinese science policy at the moment. There is this divergence in, from a domestic perspective between it all has to solve Chinese problems, uh, the pragmatic orientation at applicability versus still a strong orientation at global uh, indicators of scientific excellence. And then also from a global perspective, there are strong signals that we see um, an increasing closure um, of China as an actor in, in the global system of science, but it's also, and even by party leaders, um, the emphasis on international collaboration and even governing of science. Um, I think from all that, what we can see and how it plays out on the ground, um, yes, there is more party steering and a party mandate or a party, part of the party instrumentalizing STI now more strongly than ever, or then, yeah, after the Mao era, maybe. Uh, but it's too early to say that these, as I said, the matter of fact, technocracy is dead. Um, I think at the moment when we see that the so-called Chinese indigenous values are integrated in evaluation, then I think it's time to maybe say that. But for the time being, it's important to look at the coexistence of these two um, powers in Chinese science policy. And altogether, as I said, um, maybe that's something we can discuss together. So is science policy in China then different from other policy fields? Um, I mean, the dynamics I have outlined, party visions, technocracies or bureaucracies that's present in any science, uh, in any policy field, I'm sorry. Yes and no, I think uh, by these, uh, just to highlight the, the global embeddedness again of Chinese scientific contributions, you can see that it's something that goes beyond a domestic um, dimension and perspective. That's maybe one factor while being a policy field where we have no global uh, governance system for it. And, but I'll, I'll stop uh, that here and we can discuss it further. And then just the last point, I think um, it's, so you can come to, I think, very different conclusions if you look at these macro data and illustrations uh, and quantitative impressions. Um, but what is important to me also is to look qualitatively at things that are going on on the ground. And if I, as I just said, so far, I have just I, from being involved in, in cooperation myself or hearing from colleagues, I have some impressions, but it's different to corroborate them, I think, for um, fundamental research uh, yeah, presentations and output. And I'm excited to see how the rooms for that are existent or not when I myself can return to China for field research. And maybe you have some experiences to share on that point. So I'm thanking you already. And now I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for very informative and very uh, insightful uh, presentation. Um, before we open the floor to the uh, to the audience, um, I 
think you and I will discuss a few issues, and then we can address the uh, the quest questions raised by the uh, by the audience. So please help me understand what do you define science policy? Because uh, that is the first puzzle that I um, uh, when I'm listening to your to your to, to your presentation. Because as you know, my uh, myself, I'm a, um, I call myself a scholar in innovation studies. So we do. I, I do a lot of research in, in industrial policies, innovation policies, and sometimes the personnel talent policies and university university policies. But I just don't come across this term science policy. So just help me to uh, define this term. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, it might have to do with, as I said, me also not being native and struggling to find something that is equivalent to the German term of Wissenschaft, which would cover it, or you would just say it and everyone would know. And I think I, I'm missing that term um, in English. And I think it would be better, as you've suggested, to maybe add a few terms. So I would need to say it's science and technology, higher education, anything that happens in the academic sector. So I, I try to find a catch all category by saying, saying, by saying science policy, but maybe that's not very precise. So I'll think about a better term. Um, for me, it, it covers, as I have said in the beginning, many more fields than just natural sciences. Um, it is the idea in my view how the state leadership envisions what should happen in the fields of research and education, uh, basically. Um, so I agree that it's not the best of terms and I'll think uh, about a better one, yeah. Thank you. So the second question, so from your study, what do you attribute uh, China's success? I use the term research output rather than research other than research breakthroughs uh, over the past um, 15, 20 years uh, from the policy perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, um, what is measurable in these quantitative indicators is output in certain fields. So you can measure publication output in general. I think it's more important to measure citations because they show how much, yeah, how much others uh, attribute quality to these outputs, um, patents, um, and so I think indicators show that in specific fields, these uh, China's contributions are on top, coming out on top of all these uh, countings. So I think that that is in a way um, a cooperation for that. And, and it happens in many of the fields that are outlined in these plans by the Chinese um, leadership to be focus areas um, from quantum computing to aerospace and space tech uh agricultural studies um uh, as i said emission technologies they were all in the catalogs and they are also coming out on top so i think i'm i'm not a fan of of drawing yeah immediate conclusions or causal relations from that but um i think there is ways to to trace successes of certain policies i would say <laughs> Great, thank you for your explanation. Because I'm doing a, a, a research recently on the, um, it's basically an article. I'm uh, um, trying to provide a, a counterbalanced view um, to what ASPI's um, findings and recommendations, because I don't, totally don't agree with their findings, certainly don't agree with their recommendations. In my view, uh, their methodology is flawed and the uh, con uh, conclusions can be really misleading because the consequences could be they're flaming unnecessary geopolitical tension between the West and China. And the consequences could be China's Chinese research community to be cut off from those very sick links between China and the US and with Europe. So um, I agree with you. Um, I mean, research about outputs, um, why China is, making a lot of progress. But I think it's very important for us to pay attention to um, research quantity and quality, as you said, and different incentive um, mechanisms and the research quality could be different. I mean, as you said, German scientists, they do research out of their academic freedom and their um, scientific curiosities. But, and the China's incentive strategy well, I mean, publications, past following is the easiest is a shortcut. Uh, 
So I think that is something we need to, uh, I mean, you, you, you perhaps need to pay attention to. And that's one, the first thing. And second thing is, um, is sometimes it's not fair to just compare research outputs. The reason is, if, if you look at Chinese Academy of Science, I mean, you said 300 key uh, national key laboratories, over 100 and the name of CSCS. So that gives that organization enormous um, advantages just purely because of its sheer size. So, so I think um, I, I, I think we need to um, to to pay attention to uh, how you differentiate uh, basic research and applied research. So that's that probably will make your findings more interesting. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very important. Um inspirations and I share your I completely share your skepticism vis-a-vis uh, -vis these uh, big indexes ASPI and others I think I mean I think there are numbers that are hard to hard to ignore but I would tend to align more with those yeah looking at mm. yeah or mm. coming from within the scientific community then think tank uh, analysis but I mean we, we have think tanks here in Germany as well that do that. And I, I also share your worries about the consequences that might have because these just this, this one study alone, the report about it in German media has created such an outcry in, in German. Like, wow. I mean, it's it's not that these numbers are new or like the development is new. It just shows that there is so, so little understanding of things that are going on um, in China from a European perspective. But as you say, there, there are more creating, I think, fear mongering and, and this vision of an overreaching China, then that they help in. Exactly, exactly. So that, that, that's, that, that's my fear. I mean, that could lead to um, intensified uh, China threat. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's, that's just from the Western's perspective, but from China's perspective, that might push the government to increase their concentration um, in terms of governing science. That's the term I think used in this webinar. I think that's a really good term. So um, and as, as we can see um, during the two sessions, China has already made um, several very um, aggressive uh, institutional reform proposals, uh, largely on the science and technology. So, um, I mean, if, because um, I, I don't really know science policy, but I do know uh, technology. Even there is a long dis distance between science and technology and innovation. Um, I think uh, if I just uh, attribute the most important policy um, factor in China's um, um, catch up or rise in science and technology is um, uh, is a very pragmatic oriented uh, policy in the past 20 years. And uh, it seems now the wind is changing direction. And this can be a reaction to both domestic challenges China is facing and also um, very uh, hostile environment Ch China is, is, is dealing geopolitically. So this kind of uh, non-necessary, uh, I mean, even non-verified image of China's leading, dominating in critical technologies will exactly push China to further control uh, from the top. And that will be a nightmare for the science and technology, not just for China and for the humankind. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, just one example is the discussion on completely excluding China scholarship council holders. Exactly. Mm. The debate again is so, I mean, in principle, I, I can, uh, I don't know. I can I can even understand the contra arguments, and if you take, but what I find very disturbing is that in all these debates about what could be a top reactions to things like that, there is no long term, no long term perspective. There are no scenarios being shown on what that would mean. Um, even though you could maybe understand the reasons for taking such a decision, but what would it mean? What effects would it have? And that is in Europe at least that's completely lacking. And that makes the discussion so difficult and also, yeah, produce some worries on my side on where this is going. Mm -hmm. If I may, I ask, I can offer a bit of my um, experience uh, being a Chinese, na native Chinese, um, well, I'm not 
legally, but um, um, I'm a native speaker, so um, I can make sense of the, uh, the, the sort of a subtle subtleties commonly embedded in policy documents, and especially from the central um, policy perspective, and you would never see very clear-cut definitions, and policies tend to use very ambiguous language. The reason is uh, policymakers tend to leave a lot of leeway and leave a lot of room for the maneuver. Sorry, oh, my apology. So uh, for, for a maneuver in the future, um, I think it's time for us to, to address a few questions. And